Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power's Save Our Game. Donating at least 100,000 to Irish football via England goals this summer. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie And a very good morning and you're welcome along to another episode of the Euro 2020 show here on Off The Ball. Shane Hanlon with you every single day, midweek day for the duration of the tournament when there is a game on of course uh, and we're live on the, all, all the usual places as well OTB Sports Radio that's in the OTB Sports app which you can download for free in the App Store or indeed in the Play Store we're live as well on stream now youtube.com forward slash off the ball Facebook and indeed on our Twitter and Periscope at off the ball and our OTB Sports Euro 2020 show is live with Paddy Powers Save Our Game donating €10,000 to Irish football for every goal England scored at the Euros that means Raheem Sterling's goal at the weekend against Croatia that's €10,000 so far in the kitty for Irish football, which is a pretty good news. Over the coming weeks, I'll be joined by regular guests Eamon Dunphy and Damien Delaney, plenty of Euros legends and football insiders and journalists as well, as we preview the upcoming matches. Italian football writer Paddy Agnew, who else, will be with us very shortly this morning to talk to Italians last night. And I'll be joined every single day by a different member of Team Off the Ball, as always. This morning, it's the turn of Phil Egan. Phil, good morning. Good morning, Shane. How are you doing? Keeping well, I know you're a you're a proponent and supporter of my dodgy shirt collection. Oh, yeah. So I figured I was going to don this little number today, and it, kind of an Italian vibe off it. I don't exactly look too Italian, but I just wanted to do it in in tribute to to those players last night because what a show they put on. Yeah, absolutely, and obviously you know the Italians know a thing or two about style. We <laughs> just have to look at the lovely blazers they've been wearing at the Euros and. They've pretty much hit every note perfectly since even Bocelli's performance before the whole tournament kicked off. And yeah, it's. Uh, I think personally, I've always had this fascination with the Italian team, it, Italian football, where you, you watch them in tournament football and they kind of grow into it. You, you know, you only have to think back to when we beat them at the '94 World Cup and they recover and they go the, all the way to the final. This is different, where they've hit the ground running and they're relentless. And now we're we're just wondering. Can they keep it going? Because they have been exhilarating two, three nil wins, and yeah, massive credit to Roberto Mancini because they looked like a really well-oiled, well-coached team, and I think uh, they're the team to to watch so far at the moment. Just ridiculous to watch. I mean, that game last night, like as you said to me before, we came on air like yesterday's football. Generally, watching it, I've enjoyed this tournament. Uh, hugely so far and, and as I've said in previous episodes with the 2014 uh, thing in it you know you, you hoped or, that the quality wouldn't be dil- diluted and certainly so far it hasn't even teams like like Finland have kind of shown up and uh, and performed on the day but Italy last night were just something else and you made the point to me in WhatsApp as well that Marco Verratti is yet to come into this team so we haven't seen it- Italy at their full strength just yet No and the beauty of the fact that they've now won their two games they can rest players for the Wales game and who knows Verratti could be back they could get some minutes under his belt for that one and uh, yeah they just they're playing so well that we're not really even talking about Verratti the only reason I mentioned them to you was because it was just scary how good they were playing and I was thinking like Verratti hasn't even played for them yet and obviously he didn't play at the Euros he didn't qualify for the last World Cup and this is the most impressive thing about it where Mancini took over a team that hadn't qualified for the World Cup first time since the 50s and look at them now and you know I think I'm enjoying the tournament so much because the last 18 months obviously football was on hold for a while then we had football with no fans and I just found towards the end of a lot of the the, the Premier League season we were watching games with no fans and it was all a bit soulless and it was almost like we convinced ourselves I know it's grand but then the fans started to come back in and then you f- see the the reaction and just the passion and even watching the anthems like the Italian anthem obviously is, a, is one of the, the best anthems out there um, but I think back to even the FA Cup final when Thielemann scores to see fans behind the goal cheering that and that's what football was all about so I think the Euros at one stage looked like this was the worst possible way to hold a tournament where you've got multiple cities but so far it's worked out pretty well like yeah, that it's definitely added to the atmosphere without a shadow of a doubt. And I, I was the same as yourself, a little bit sceptical about the whole eleven cities, twelve cities thing, whatever it is. And yet, it's worked. It certainly worked. And look, Italy have the advantage of of playing games in Rome, which certainly helps them. But I mean, it, hypothetically speaking, here, so Italy are, are getting out of this group. But if they meet a, a France or an England or a Portugal, 
you know, how are they going to fare? Because we've only seen them against against the Turks, who have been proven to be fairly poor, it has to be said, uh, certainly poorer than we expected heading, heading into this tournament. Uh, and they beat a Swiss team last night, who uh, held on for, for quite some time in that game, but still were, were overpowered. But if they meet one of the big guns, how do you expect Italy? Like, has your, has your favourites changed over the, pro- the process of the, the, the opening game so far? No, I would have boringly picked France to win. And I think just watching them against Germany the other night proved the point that you look at the talent that France have and you probably, people looking at Italy last night thinking, why can't France play like that? Because, you know, they've got better players. But France are very comfortable playing the way that they play. And that's just th- that is something that's obviously won them a World Cup. It got, to them, got them to the final at the Euros five years ago as well. And they play well within themselves. They have players that can come up with magic moments. So I think the way things are looking, if France and Italy win their groups, if they were to keep going, they would meet in a potential semi-final. But that's I think we're thinking way too far ahead because France obviously still have to play Portugal. Uh, Italy might end up playing Belgium in a, a quarter-final. That, you know, that's going to be a test for them if if they get past their last 16 game as well. So I think the one thing looking at Italy... Obviously, we know they're, they're pressing very well. There's a lot of energy there. We saw one or two moments where if they were exposed at the back, mm. you know, how would Benucci and obviously Chiellini came off? Um, it, it didn't look too bad. Maybe Chiellini was just wanted to just sit on the bench for a while and just take a seat, and the best seat in the house, and just look at how good this Italian team is. But, you know, he, he didn't look like he was... Uh, in that much pain he's he's obviously an old campaigner he knows his body well and he probably just thought you know what something's not right there i'm going to come off because we've made a good start here we're probably going to win the game no point in risking it but yeah there was just a few moments where i thought if you could get down the sides of the the italian central defense or, and even they obviously have full backs that like to push on mm. but italy can there's one way of counteracting that is just make sure you hold on to the ball or you press high, then your defence doesn't actually get that exposed. Yeah, Chiellini's injury was probably the only, like, I guess, negative mark that came out of the game last night. And like as you said, I think Keener or, or Neville or one of them on, on television yesterday kind of saying, yeah, he's an elder statesman, a younger player might play on through the pain barrier and just make the injury worse. But Chiellini is that experienced and uh, knowledgeable that he knows his body, as you said. Uh, we'll talk more about Italy with uh, Paddy Agnew very shortly. But uh, the other g- our game in Group A yesterday in Baku, Turkey nil, Wales two. Uh, another cracking game this one, uh, Phil. And I mean, it was the crowd of thirty thousand, I think, in in Baku for this game. And granted, uh, probably an away game in many ways for for Wales, um, and a bit of a shock to the system for them, no doubt, even temperature wise. But uh, like I, we were talking to uh, Danny Gabbard yesterday and speaking about the twenty sixteen group when they uh, beat the Slovaks lost to England and then needed a result against Russia in the last game and delivered big time well they needed a result yesterday against Turkey a decent Turkey team and they delivered they, Wales just seem to deliver when they need to get a result yeah they've uh, only France have a better record in them in the last few years in competitive games at major tournaments or at the European Championships but I think what was so impressive was that obviously Gareth Bale we know is he slowed down but he just he, he's a playmaker now and he just kept playing the same kind of ball into Aaron Ramsey, missed the first couple of chances, didn't let the head drop, got in, third time lucky, scored. Then you think Turkey are going to have to come back here. Bale wins the penalty and I just thought at the time, yeah, puts that away and it's game over. And when he misses, then you think they might regret that. But how naive are Turkey where they kept conceding those same chances to Aaron Ramsey. Then at the end... Most players would keep the ball in the corner. Gareth Bale tried something clever, almost got a goal out of it, get another corner, does the same, and they do get a goal out of it. And you're just thinking the Turkish lads didn't learn anything. And a lot of people had talked them up before the tournament, but they looked like a team that weren't very well coached yesterday. And um, it seemed to really just suit Wales that Bale had talked about it in the build-up to the game, saying that it is going to be hostile, but this is what you love. And... Players obviously have missed this buzz of having an atmosphere where you get in the ball, you're jeered and it just kind of drives you on. And yeah, Bale was was brilliant. And Daniel James as well just shows like they have players in the right positions where they're well organized and they're hard to create chances against, but they have those few players in the right positions, the likes of Bale, Ramsey, Daniel James, and obviously Kiefer Moore gives you that outlet to to hit 
a target man and you could see that sometimes you just there's no point in jumping with him. I mean at one stage Sionchu did win a header off him and uh, Kiefer Moore gets a bloody nose off the, the challenge but sometimes you just have to let him take his touch and don't let him turn but yeah they're, they're going to fancy their chances of getting to a quarter final now look they're not through but four points was enough to get to the last 16 in the last tournament so should be there. Should, should be, there. be there. Yeah, yeah like Robert Page, what he's done with that team is is exceptional, really. Considering, uh, you know, he's he's kind of stepped up in the twenty ones and parachuted into that role. But if you look at, um, I mean, it was great to see, as you mentioned, Bale and Dan James swapping wings yesterday and just causing havoc for the Turkish defence. But maybe just a word, Phil, on, on Aaron Ramsey's display yesterday, because even aside from the finish uh, for the first goal. Uh, really, really majestic performance from him and something we, we saw for a couple of seasons at Arsenal. I don't yeah. know if Juventus fans have seen much of it, but um, Paddy might be able to tell us a bit more on that maybe, but such, such a good performance from him. And if he keeps playing like that, then as you said, Wales could go to the quarterfinals and even further. Yeah, and the beauty is he just he knows how to time those runs. And in real time, you think, oh, is he onside? And there was the one where he blasted it over the bar and he looked over at the flag waiting for a flag but it wasn't there because he times his runs impeccably and you know with the first chance I think he should go across the keeper but saying that if he puts it in the the near side then everyone says what a great finish and then the second one is a real lack of composure and yeah a lot of players in the third chance the confidence would be gone but you know he didn't hit it that well but because he was that close once he got it on target it went in and then even in the second half there was a chance where Turkey got in then the left just about to get a shot away and there was Aaron Ramsey blocking it and that's just Wales have really upped it and it's something we used to do in tournaments where we'd arrive at tournaments and we play above what we were used to and we bring it on the big occasion and Wales are certainly doing that and um, yeah there's a very good chance they could reach a quarter final but just need to get I mean I think Italy are going to make changes. Obviously, they'd be probably forced to make one or two changes. But there's a chance if Wales just pick up a draw against Italy, then uh, they'll they'll get second place in that group. Yeah, looking forward to that Wales Italy game now. Even if it it does mean a little bit less, um, given that they're both up, but essentially through to the next round. But uh, Phil, before we get to Paddy Agnew, I want to bring you my uh, team of the tournament, Rolling All Stars team of the tournament. So this is first of all yesterday's uh, team. So I had uh, for the benefit of the podcast listeners, Vachlik of the Czech Republic in goals, the back four of Dumfries for the Netherlands. Chiellini for Italy, Skriniar, Slovakia and Thomas Munier for Belgium. Across the middle end, Yarmolenko for Ukraine, Pogba for France, Gini Wijnaldum for the Netherlands and Berardi for Italy with the top two of uh, Belgium and Portugal's Lukaku and Ronaldo. Phil, I have made changes. I've made yeah. three changes based off yesterday's games. Uh, out comes um, Gini Wijnaldum and in comes Manuel Locatelli, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, if someone is, is excellent for a second time, I will, of course, bring Gini Wijnaldum back in. He t- probably didn't deserve to be taken out, but Locatelli's been excellent. Uh, Yarmolenko's out, regardless of that wonderful curling goal that Aaron Ramsey is in after his display yesterday. And Chiellini, given he came off injured after 15 minutes, is out and in. Joe Rodon for Wales, uh, another excellent display. He'll put his body on the line for his country, no shadow of a doubt. What do, you, what do you make of this team? You can rip it apart. Who would you put in? Who would you replace? Um, I think one obvious one for me there is the left-back, Mounier. Mm. I think I'm looking at Spinazzola there. Just at times you don't even realise he's a left. He's playing left back, and if you look at the the Italian shape, that's when he goes forward. They they're uh, they're basically when they have the ball, they're, they're a three at the back. But what I said earlier about them being well coached, when a player is out of position, one of his teammates just drops in and and fills the gap. And you know it, it can look quite simple, but it's something that it you know it takes hours of training to work out. And you see uh, when. A really well coached team doesn't have the ball that's when you see how good they are yeah where you as i mentioned turkey there you were looking at them yesterday and there was just gaps everywhere and no one knew how to like it's not as if gareth bale is this unknown talent where give him time and he can pick a pass but he had all this time in midfield and he's just able to pick out his his go-to ball for those aaron ramsey runs but um yeah uh, Look, I, I know it's, it's, it's hard to keep everyone happy in terms of the <laughs> strike force. I think Lukaku, yeah, I think Immobile obviously got his, his goal again last night, so he, he's joined Lukaku. Patrick Sheik is probably worth a mention as mm, well. For sure. But um, 
yeah, that that team is just going to keep changing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, Schick's unlucky, Immobile's unlucky, Mbappe's probably unlucky. Bale is probably unlucky. I, I didn't put him in because uh, for one one reason only that he um, he looked up at the cameras as players tend to do in these in these stadiums just before he hit the penalty, almost checking that he looked looked okay for a celebration. I don't like players doing that. <laughs> hit the penalty, just score the penalty. Oh, not, I'm not saying I put him off, but because Ronaldo does the same thing and looks up at the camera and then. Uh, puts the penalty away but uh, players need to stop looking at the camera yeah. just put the penalty away it's an awful penalty I think if they get another one I would hope that Kiefer Moore says I'll take this <laughs> one because I think he's I think he's scored his last four for Cardiff so there you go. Um, let the big man take it next time for sure and just a reminder our OTB Sports Euro 2020 show is live with Paddy Powers Save Our Game donating €10,000 to Irish football for every goal England that scored at the Euros that means Raheem Sterling's goal has €10,000 in the bank already a very good morning now to the Italian football writer Paddy Agnew Paddy good morning Good morning to you folks. Or buongiorno, I should say, to yourself, I think. Uh, Bun, buongiorno to you. What a, what a performance uh, from the Italians last night. And uh, I mean, it was just uh, something out of this world that we... That we uh, people kind of put them in the dark horse category. At least some people put them in the dark horse category coming into this tournament. And yet they have such a remarkable unbeaten run that it's a bit surprising that, that they were even there. So uh, what's, the, what's the vibe in Italy after last night's performance? Oh, well, you can imagine. Uh, things are getting very excited around here. Uh, there's a huge sense of relief. Uh, you know, people like me have been writing that this is a very interesting team and this is uh, Italy are, are on the way back for the last 18 months. But it was until they actually got here and won a couple of games, you could think to yourself, well, we got that wrong, we were a bit too uh, ahead of ourselves. And there's also the, the, the most important thing about this is it is coming into this tournament uh, on the back of two great tragedies. Uh, and, and forgive me if I compare the two things, but the, Italy is recovering like the rest of uh, the world from the pandemic. Italy was the first country in Europe to be hit by uh, coronavirus. So there's a whole sense of getting back on the road uh, and Italy is getting back on the road. And then uh, the smaller tragedy, of course, the sporting tragedy of not qualifying for Russia 2018. And that really, uh, you know, Chiellini, uh, I've said this before, but Chiellini said, well, basically that was the lowest moment in the last 50 years of Italian football. Yeah, uh, it certainly was uh, one that you, you thought they'd take some time to bounce back from, but they've done a remarkable job. And like I've heard you speak in Paddy before about Il Gruppo, this collective team spirit yeah. that Roberto Mancini yeah. has kind of nurtured in this team. And uh, has that, uh, has the, has, I guess, COVID and, and like you brought it up and the, the impact of COVID in places like Bergamo, where you know thousands of people were, uh, died, yes. um, has that kind of helped nurture this collective team spirit, everyone in the country getting behind the team because they realise this is clearly a good team that that can maybe help the country heal. I know football isn't the be-all and end-all, but certainly an Italian win in this tournament would, would lift the national mood. Absolutely. No, that is what is happening. One of the, I mean, uh, along the way to these finals, one of the things that Italy did was they played one of the qualifying games in Bergamo. And on the day before that, Viali and Mancini and a couple of players laid a wreath at a memorial to the people who've lost their lives in Bergamo. So, uh, uh, and also last night, uh, there wasn't an Italian player interviewed after the game who didn't say, you know, uh, this victory is dedicated to all those who uh, suffered and lost loved ones because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So it, it is a very much a, a, a national cause, a, one of national resurrection, which is allied to footballing resurrection. I mean, how much credit does Roberto Mancini need uh, for this one? Because he seems to have changed the mentality of this team. Um, yeah. And, you know, we, we remember, yeah, yeah. we think of Italian teams as quite defensive and quite uh, um, not a, exactly exciting to watch. But now, we, myself and Phil were talking about it. I mean, you turn on that game last night excited and you're left not disappointed by, by the way in which they play. How much credit <laughs> does Roberto Mancini need for that? Huge amount. I mean... Uh, what you and Phil were saying uh, the, the, about the Italian team, uh, how exciting it is, is the way, I put it this way. Somebody who knows football, if you brought them in to watch uh, the uh, two games that they've played so far in this uh, tournament, and you didn't give them a commentary and you didn't tell them who was playing, they wouldn't believe if you said that, that one of the teams, the team that's winning three nil each time is Italy, because it's not in Italy anybody uh, at national team level has ever seen before. This is it, Paddy. Um, it's it's so strange to we kind of associate Italian teams that get the goal and that's it, shut up shop. But yeah, now yeah. you have an Italian team going in for the kill, keep going, yeah. going for the second. And 
Shay mentioned that you know we associate defensive teams, but while they're doing this, they're keeping clean sheets. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, uh, it's a it's a brilliantly balanced team in the sense that he's got the old Italian defence, Bonucci, Chiellini, Acerbi, these guys in the centre of defence, and they're pretty solid. But they're the only element of that solid defence, and everybody else is is expected to get up there and get across the halfway line, get into their uh, opponent's half of the field. People are starting to wonder now. There's a few conversations around the office this morning after these two performances. Will Italy be able to maintain this? Will they be able yeah. to keep it going? But yeah. I was saying there, the fact that the, the Welsh game is coming up on Sunday, Mancini has the, the luxury of being able to rest a few players. Well, he, he rest, he will, he's going to have a couple of injury enforced uh, changes, I suspect. I mean, Killini won't be playing, uh, and the one or two other players have got knocks. But um, he may, he won't rest too. He won't. There was a possibility before the, uh, yesterday's matches that Italy might be already qualified, already, already have won the group if uh, Wales had drawn yesterday. Uh, but that hasn't happened. Italy have not won the group. They want to win the group. Mancini made it absolutely clear last night we want to win the group. Uh, so. I think they'll play a pre the, you know they're not going to be too many it's not going to be making too many changes it's going to be a, a, a very tough side and um, this morning on, on BBC Wales uh, I uh, I told them I thought that uh, Italy would beat them I'm probably not going to get too many free holiday offers in, in Wales this summer but I, I definitely think that there will be Wales. Uh, it, it strikes me, Paddy, as well, like that uh, disappointing defeat to the Swedes in 2017. I mean, do teams sometimes need to kick up the arse to, to kind of get them get themselves in gear, these powerhouses especially? I mean, that, that result and, and not making the 2018 World Cup has perhaps done something to the psyche of this team that has really, really given them a sharp focus heading into this tournament. Well, this is a different team. That was a different coach, Ventura, mm. and that was a, a, a lot of different players. And... Uh, you know, the, the important thing here is that Mancini had an idea of what he... He was starting off from the very beginning. The slate was wiped clean, which was maybe an advantage because he was able to bring in a lot of young players. I mean, Zaniolo was not here. He had him called into the national team before he played even a single game in Serie A because, like, Mancini's a guy who knows his football on he recognises a good player. Uh, and he's uh, gone along his track playing, uh, bringing in players who can really... Uh, are really comfortable on the ball, who can knock it around, who are very uh, comfortable with an attacking game, uh, and he has—he's stuck by that. He hasn't—he hasn't wavered for a second in that, and the results, fortunately for him, have gone with him. And uh, like, interestingly, Paddy as well, watching the, the match on television yesterday, had Roy Keane and Gary Neville in, in uh, the ITV studio, and uh, the quote from one of them was that once they start to play against better teams, they won't have enough. Um, you know, they weren't buying this Italy hype that uh, the rest of us are, I guess. But uh, do you kind of what would you say to that? Like, when we come when Italy come up against teams like France, like Portugal, uh, perhaps like England, um, how do you think they will fare? No, that's a big question, Mark. I absolutely agree with with Roy Keane and anybody else who says that. Uh, one of the, the, you know, there are a number of things we didn't know about this Italy coming into. The first one was would they be able to uh, live with the pressure of the big occasion? Okay, they've answered that. But uh, up until this point, the beaten sides like you know uh, Finland, Armenia, Bosnia in the qualifying round, the beaten now uh, uh, Switzerland and Turkey, but they haven't played the biggies. And they haven't played the biggie since Mancini's taken over. The 29 match on beaten run does not include uh, wins against Portugal, Germany, or France. Uh, and I would agree with them. Uh, also, this is uh, an unusual Italian team. You don't have a lot. You don't have sort of uh, uh, Marco Tardelli, Gentili type, Sherea type figures. Big, big, strong men. There are a lot. Of, it's a lightweight midfield. Uh, will they have the physical? Strength to last the tournament? That's a big, big question. And will they be able to mix it with sides like France and Germany? I mean, I watched the France, um, we all watched the France Germany game the other night. And I thought, you know, these are two very, very good teams. And I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, put, stick my hand in the fire for Italy managers to survive it if they have to mix it with them. I mean, in particular, if you're talking about a game that gets particularly physical, I can see I can see Italy uh, being in a bit of difficulty. Is there any chance that if Mancini did come up against well, 
you would imagine they're going to come up against one of the biggies later in the tournament that he changes things tactically. Obviously, a 4-3-3, and you could see at times that they like to go for it, but th there is definitely a little bit of space left in behind. But would he, would he tweak his formation? I don't think so. There's no sign of him doing that. Uh, but, I mean, I'd worry about this Italian team against uh, Mbappe, for example. You know, I mean, that the guy, that sort of pace. The Italians defend by, for an Italian team very high up. Uh, and, you know, they leave space behind them. And if uh, he runs, Mbappe runs in that space, <laughs> he, he's got a lot of difficulties. Just ask Matt Tummels. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Ask, ask anybody who's played against the guy. But that that defensive record, I mean, it, it's it's quite extraordinary. You know, thirteen clean sheets yeah. for Italy in fifteen matches now, which, you know, and a backline that's gone is approaching ten hours or try a thousand minutes, ten games without without conceding a goal. So, I guess the the teams that go deep into tournaments have certain things. They have a solid defence, they have strength and depth, and they have good attacking talent and. Yeah, France might take all and three of those. And they have a good goalkeeper. They have a good goalkeeper as well. And Italy, with Donnarumma as well, they're taking all of these boxes, uh, Paddy. Yeah, they are. The only worry I have is that Chiellini and uh, Bonucci, uh, between them, are 70 years old, you know? Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they have 206 caps, you know what I mean? Uh, and they both had injury problems uh, uh, through uh, the season. So... I'd be worried about. I would. It, what I see is a bit like. Uh, I don't know if you remember the 2012 European Championships. You know, Italy had a, a very good run. They got through to the final. But by the time they got to the final, uh, there were too many players carrying knocks and things, and they just didn't last it out. And they got, uh, you know, run over by Spain in that final. Whereas had given Spain a very, very good game in the opening match of that that tournament. In fact, they played better than Spain. Uh, I guess the the one of the things that that I've uh, noticed about this Italian squad in the build up was that nineteen of the twenty six haven't played in a major tournament final yeah. before, yeah. which which is I guess not surprising considering that it's a it's an all new Italian team. There's a lot of youngsters in the team, and uh, they didn't qualify for the World Cup in Russia, of course, as we know. But uh, is that is that something that you know there's maybe there's blind confidence in, in in youth that you know they they don't they have never felt the pressure of a major tournament finals before, so. They're going into it with full of confidence, or do you think that it could act against them? And, and like, as they go deeper into the tournament, that lack of experience might count against them. No, I think it's the former rather than the latter of the two things you're saying. Because before this tournament, we uh, people like me were pointed out the 19 out of the 26 have never been here before, and we thought, well, will they get stage fright? Well, they haven't got, had stage fright. I don't think they're going to get stage fright. And on the contrary, the fact they haven't been there before has uh, enabled them to play with. Uh, in, in an uninhibited manner. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the, the first goal last night, it was, you know, a, a pure piece of football folly, football madness. But, you know, Locatelli hits a, a you know, 60 yard ball <laughs> to uh, Team Berardi on the right wing, but well, first time. Uh, and then follows into the area to finish it off. I mean, that uh, sort of football, you have to be in very, very good. Uh, mental and physical, of course, help to score that one. Some of these players, Paddy, are in the shop window now as well. They, they might have yeah. been, they might have been household names before the tournament. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. people that watch Italian football week in, week out know who they are. But yeah, like you, you mentioned Locatelli there, and we were talking yeah. about Spinazzola as well. Yeah, yeah. No, those two, those two, I suspect are going to be uh, moving on. You know, the thing about Locatelli is that. He's a uh, he's from uh, northern Italy, and his his first big club was, was AC Milan, and he started off very well with AC Milan, scored again a goal against uh, uh, Juventus in one of his earliest games for them. But uh, then, for reasons best known to themselves, probably uh, budgetary reasons, M Milan let him go, um, and something that Locatelli still feels bad about. Uh, and uh, you know, I think he said he, he will be going. He will now be going to a bit, uh, not a provincial side. He plays for Sassuolo, of course, as people, I should say. Uh, and he'll be going to, you know, I can see him going to somewhere like Inter, AC Milan, Juventus. Uh, those would be the obvious places for him. And like Spinazzola, I don't know. I think Spinazzola is quite happy to be back in Italian football. And uh, I think he's quite happy at Roma. I think he might well stay at Roma. Yeah, well, just in terms of, we've obviously talked about Mancini and we mentioned the 
the pandemic. So what are the papers saying this morning? What is the connection now between this team and the people of Italy? We see the passion. It just so happens, like the Italian anthem is just, uh, it's a thing of beauty, but <laughs> you, you watch the, the players absolutely belt it out before each game. Yeah. But is, you know, is this a team that has really resonated with the people of Italy? And, you know, how, obviously the further they go in the competition, you know, the, the greater that relationship is going to become. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, remember as well, obviously, this is like Italy have had, uh, it's like Italian event all over again to a certain extent, at least for the first four games, they're playing in their home. It's a huge, it's a huge advantage. You know, they haven't had to travel off the back room back in like Wales have had, they, you know, or like Switzerland have had. Uh, 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 that, that's a huge advantage. But it, it's also one thing I'd say about this team that, 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 that uh, you know, uh, Shane was saying uh, or sorry, uh, earlier, the, um, the sense of the group, uh, you know, Mancini has put this very uh, carefully together again. He's got, he's got in his own management structure he's got people he relies on you know like you know uh, uh, Salsano Lombardo uh, and Viali all played with him the Santori team that won the title in 1991 and Oriali who was alongside him when he was winning titles with Inter as a manager he's got a very very tight organised uh, group of uh, management group and that is reflected in uh the strong sense of 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 each uh, group that's coming out of this team, and which they all all the players talk about, and which uh, seems to resonate all right with the Italian public. The Italian public are uh, at the moment delighted about them. And as for headlines this morning, uh, the the best one, at least it seems to be the best one, the most Italian one was from uh, Angus Gazette of the Sport this morning. They just put bellissima, bellissima. <laughs> that's perfect. Just on yeah, Mancini, what is the feeling on Mancini now and what was it like when he took the job? Obviously, Italy were at a low point and he came in and it wasn't his contract. It was, um, you know, it, it was on the basis of having to get to the get to the Euros if it was going to get extended. That's right, yeah. Uh, it has been extended since it's extended on to, to Qatar, but... Uh, yeah, the, the, it was such a low at the time he took over uh, that uh, there was a certain um, amount of disinterest and dissidence, actually. People just thought, oh, well, what, what, what difference will make? We're going to lose again. Uh, and he has completely turned that on its head. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I, I, I've said, uh, and I repeat about Mancini, is, I mean, I've... I've I've watched Mancini as a, a player and a coach, and he was a wonderful player, absolutely gorgeous player. He did the most remarkable things as a player, but I think he's going to be an even better coach. It's amazing. Yeah, he's really, really uh, exceeded expectations of a lot of people. He's, he's, he's done remarkably well, well with these players, but uh, Paddy, just to pick up on something you said there in terms of the, the, the home advantage in Rome, and yeah, uh, this this effect in in Rome is something that's certainly with the Italian players is important because uh, they haven't lost a competitive game in Rome since 1953. Um, so, like when if they do once once they get outside the the group stages, do you think that's going to be uh, you know an impact on them that, that maybe playing you know tra having you travel you travel like teams like Switzerland like you mentioned have done. I mean, will this will that impact the Italian team or their or the home comfort something that's made it maybe added to their performances so far? Yeah. I don't. I absolutely agree. Yeah, that would be one of. The, if you say to me, "I'd be going to crack later on," that would be one of the reasons you could point to. No doubt about it. Uh, again, you know, the nineteen out of the twenty-six has never been in a situation like that. They've never gone and played a, 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 a World Cup or a European Championship quarter-final in uh, London or Amsterdam or wherever it's going to be. So yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's one that uh, we'll wait and see. All I can say is that the uh, momentum is, is very very strong. Uh, and because of the momentum being strong, one well, of the bad the bad news for Wales is that Mancini is clearly aware of that he doesn't want the momentum to be halted in any way. He wants to beat Wales just as impressively as he beat uh, uh, Turkey and and uh, and, uh, and uh, last night. So uh, the uh, the news for Wales in that sense isn't good. 
not to not to compare Italy to uh, <clears throat> to Bielsa's leads or anything, but when when some of the stats came up on screen yesterday and they were showing, yeah. you know, the running distance that Italy had done compared to Switzerland, yeah. and they had completely outran Switzerland in that game. And then you saw the long bursting run that Locatelli made to get on the end of, yeah. of his goal, and yeah. uh, he just the sheer determination to get there. Um, and the running that that these players do is that something that that you've noticed more and more in Italy over the last couple of years that the, you know, the kilometers are, are going up and the, and the work ethic has never been better. Well, it's something that applies to only a very small number of Italian football teams. I mean, uh, club football, a lot of teams, uh, it doesn't apply to. Uh, one team it does apply to, that maybe is an exception, is Atalanta. Atalanta have come from being a provincial side to a, a Champions League qualifier every year. And one of the things they do is they play a, 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 an up-tempo, in much more intense game than a, a, a number of the Serie A teams, which tend to sit, or, which tend to sit back, tend to like to knock it around. But Mancini, though, is much closer to the Atalanta version. Uh, and incidentally, one of the teams that does play uh, very attractive football in, in, in Italy and is finishing these days mid-table is Sassuolo the team that Locatelli plays for, uh, as does Berardi. Uh, and uh, they are the shape of a different Italian football. But it's taking, it's taking time, obviously, for that to, that revolution to, to uh, fall into place. But it, Mancini's uh, Italy is certainly a terrific example for them. Uh, when we talk about Marco Verratti and, and, and the fact that he's to come yeah. back into this team... Um, I guess we 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 often assume with with big players like that for a country like Italy that you just automatically assume they're going to walk back into this team. But I yeah. guess Locatelli yeah. was the obvious replacement for for Verratti when we heard he was injured. But uh, I assume Verratti comes straight back into this team. There's no questions asked. Is, is there are there any uh, I guess opinions in the ether in in Italy to suggest otherwise? I don't think you will come straight back into the team for all his work. I think he'll stick with uh, Locatelli. Um, uh, the Verratti injury is obviously serious enough injury because it's kept him out this far. So I, I don't see any reason why you'd rush him back. I think uh, for the game against Wales, he'd be on the bench, uh, and maybe bring him into the last twenty minutes or something. Uh, I don't. Uh, you know, one of the things that's been terrific about Mancini is that, uh, you know, what, what I had to, for for World Soccer, I had to name the Italian team last March, right? Now I got. Um, I got nine out of 11 right. One I missed out was Verratti, was injured. The other one I missed out was Berardi. Because in last March, nobody was going to say that Berardi would get in front of Chiesa. But Berardi got in front of Chiesa because his form has been terrific and that has shown itself at these championships. And that's one of the things that Mancini is very good at, uh, is understanding his players, who's well, who's not well. And uh, he goes with that. So at the moment, Locatelli, uh, you don't drop a guy like Locatelli. You know? That would be pure madness. Paddy, we're obviously talking about how good Italy have been and we're wondering, can they go to distance? One thing we haven't really talked about, can they get better? Yeah, I think they can. Um, uh, they can get better because this is all new terrain for them and they're picking up experience. Uh, the, I mean, the, 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 the only problems I could see for them are, are, are the ones I said before. Are they just a little bit too lightweight? Uh, will some of their those some of the guys with a lot of uh, kilometres up on the clock are they going to uh, have pro injury problems? But one one thing is that may be helping. I mean, you you answer me this, and one thing that may be helping is that it's quite clear to everybody that the Premiership has uh, uh, moved some way ahead of uh, Serie A. There was a time when Serie A was the, the the toughest league in the world, but that's a long time ago, uh, and. Uh, Coming out of a year in Serie A, uh, does that mean your players are have got a bit more in the tank than if you're coming out of a, a season in the Premiership? Yeah, it's something that's obviously been talked about a lot with the Premier League because they didn't have a winter break for years and Jurgen Klopp was very vocal about it when he came over to manage Liverpool. He yeah. would have been used to it and he plays that high-octane football that you mentioned there with the, with the likes of Atalanta where... Sometimes, you know, on paper your team mightn't be as good as the opposition, but the sum of all parts and a team that absolutely runs over you can be very hard to play against. And no matter how good the opposition players that Italy might face later in the tournament, if you don't give them space, they're not going to be as dangerous. And it's just, it's great to see yeah. international yeah, football yeah. played with a team that basically resembles something that you'd see in club football. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things that Fabio Capello just uh, said, he, he's not saying it now, but he said it about three years ago in, uh, in one of those weeks when three Italian clubs had gone out of European competition yet again. And uh, he said, well, the problem about Italian football, the problem about our Serie A is that it is poco allenante. It's not, it doesn't train you. It doesn't train you hard enough to play because it's not intense enough. It's not uh, uh, fast enough. The tempo is not an up tempo. It's not high octane stuff. Uh, That is uh, a lesson that I think Roberto Mancini has taken to heart because, after all, remember, Mancini is a guy who's won the Premiership title. He's won the the Premier League with Man City. He knows a different football uh, and he's brought that to bear. Would you expect uh, Mancini to take a job in, in, in England again? I, I saw some people on, on Twitter last night, uh, probably Everton fans, saying, why weren't Everton all over him? Uh, why, like, why didn't they go after this guy? He was clearly he's the top candidate at the moment. And uh, like you mentioned, the new contract for him at Italy. But surely there's a future for him in, in club football there if he wants it at, at a big, big club. Well, yeah, obviously there is, but uh, it, that will depend on the results of Italy. Mm. Uh, I, you know, uh, a lot of Italians would have said to would have said to everyone, "Well, you got a good coach in Carlo Ancelotti," uh, and you know, Ancelotti's won titles all over the place, but it didn't work out as good as the bar. What are the what are the weak links in this this Italian team then, uh, Paddy? I guess if we, we we think hypothetically here, and if Italy top this group, which looks likely, they'll play the runner up in Group C, which would be the group involving Netherlands and, and the Ukraine, Austria, North Macedonia. So, you, you're, assuming Netherlands maybe top that group, you're, you're looking at Ukraine or, or Austria yeah. in the next round. So they'll be they'll be trying yeah. to target weaknesses in this Italian team. But if you were to look at this Italian team on paper and say, right, this is this is where we can go after, you know, where are those weak links? The only weak links, you've got to be very brief to, to uh, uh, find the weak links in uh, this Italian team in the sense that, yes, they, they take risks that Italian teams haven't normally taken. They play high up the field of defence and you can get in behind them if you're willing to play high up the field yourself, if you're willing to go for it. But uh, usually they don't, uh, so far they've managed to, uh, the rhythm of the game, the tempo of the game has kept, uh, has managed to control it for them without any problem. I, I can't see, it'd be surely to me to suggest that so-and-so is um, having a bad term so far and he's uh, going to be a problem for them because it's hard to, it's hard to name a player like that in this particular situation. When you, when you talk about teams that are doing well at international level, and of course we're getting a yeah. little bit ahead of ourselves here because this is assuming that Italy go deep into this tournament, maybe go on to a semi-final final or win it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. For people who maybe don't watch as much Serie A as yourself, and, and for example this season Inter winning very comfortably, I think it was a bit yeah. 12, 12 points or whatever over AC, and you have the likes of, of Atalanta behind and Napoli and, and, and yeah. other teams kind of chasing. But has there been a, an improvement in quality in, in, in domestic football in Italy over recent years that's now being, I guess, echoed into the, the international team? Or is this kind of out of the blue? No, it's, I'd say it's more the, the, the out of the blue in the sense that, uh, you know, so, some teams uh, like Sassuolo, I mentioned, uh, Napoli, when it was coached by Muri Cisadi, uh, have, have played some terrific football and they have some terrific football. But if you watch as much Serie A as I do, I've seen some terrible matches as well over the, <laughs> over the last 30 years. But uh, uh, what what I would say is that uh, Mancini has come a bit out of the blue and he was, he's helped because he had to build up from zero. Uh, and he hasn't. He hasn't had. He hasn't had people saying, you know, you can't play that way. You should, can't do that. That's not the Italian way. People have just watched him win match after match, and, and says, yeah, well, the results. The results, as always in football, the results speak. Is there a possibility that this becomes the Italian way now? That this is the new way where <laughs> somebody reverts back to the old way of playing, and it's like, no, no, no. We've seen this is the way we want to play now the way Mancini has done it. So whoever comes in in the future, they have to play this way. Maybe, but I mean, you know, uh, I don't know how much of Interman you guys saw this year, but I mean, Interman, basically, uh, uh, Antonio Conte's team, uh, it's basically they play a 3-5-2, uh, in which a lot of the time, the main uh, uh, object of the game was to get the ball up to Lukaku and he scored, or get up to... Uh, uh, Lautaro Martinez and he scored 
Uh, and, you know, it was he, he played a team that looked very similar to the way Italy played the European Championships five years ago in France. Um, so it's not that everybody's gone uh, has gone that way. He, sir, he doesn't play... Uh, what I'm saying is the current Italian champions Inter Milan don't play remotely like uh, Roberto Mancini's Italy. Uh, and uh, uh, they're going to have a different coach next season. We'll, we'll see what, what he does. But it's... It, it, um, it's like all revolutions. It's a, it's a bit slow coming, and the Italian uh, system has been so for so long um, rooted in the basic principle of you know defend first, don't concede a goal, score a goal when you get the chance, and if it's on the counter attack, even better. Uh, that hasn't gone away entirely in some people's heads. Uh, just a couple of quick ones, uh, Paddy, before you go. You've been very good with your time. Um, away from Italy, um, uh, myself and Phil were talking about Aaron Ramsey uh, and his performance yeah. for, for Wales yesterday. Yeah. And like we, we all remember what he, what he could do for Arsenal. And uh, yeah. the performance yesterday is no surprise to anyone who knows what he is capable of. But for people who maybe haven't seen him in action for Juventus uh, as much as yourself, how has, he, how has he been playing for Juventus? Is that performance yesterday again out of the blue or is that something that's along a par with what he's been uh, a kind, kind of threatening to do with, with Juventus? No, uh, certainly not out of the blue. One of the things about uh, uh, Ramsey, I mean, normally at some point in, in a non-pandemic world, uh, uh, my pals would, would have crossed with, with him by now. So I haven't spoken to him, unfortunately. Though. But I've watched him. I've seen him a lot. Uh, and uh, I can't understand, frankly, the uh, terribly the media uh, response he's got because he's, he's not... It looks like Juventus are going to offload him. Uh, but every time I've seen him play for Juventus, he's been terrific. Uh, you know, he's played exactly the way he played yesterday. A guy who's uh, able to uh, do things when he gets on the ball, a guy who, who can get himself in a position where he might score a goal. But above all, a midfielder who uh, works all the time, he gets back and makes those sort of uh, goal saving tactics like he did late in the game against uh, Turkey yesterday. Uh, he, he looked to me like a really good player. And in his first season, um, that the, the vibes about him were very good. But the vibes about him this year don't seem to be so good. He's had a couple of injury problems as well. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And he, that means he uh, looks like he's going to be leaving Juventus. And he, he, he seemed to indicate as much the other day when he was speaking to the Welsh media. Yeah, here's hoping he can continue that form for Wales, certainly over the, the coming weeks. Um, one other player, Paddy, finally then that's... Uh, Playing his trade in Italy is, is Christian Eriksen, of course, with Inter Milan. Yeah. Um, and yeah. what what is the what has the reaction in Italy been like to, to the the terrifying news last Saturday? And look, thankfully he's okay, and we we have the news today as well that he's going to be uh, fitted with a with a heart starter device implanted um, after that collapse. So that the team doctor confirmed that in a statement today, um, which is which is good news. That hopefully at least he's, he'll be on the mend and, and and get better. Who knows if he play football again? But what's the reaction been like uh, in Italy? Huge, huge. I mean, um, Ericsson is a bit of a, a Ramsey figure uh, in the Inter uh, setup because, I mean, he, this is the second season here. He came out in January of last year. And for a long time, it, it, it seemed that uh, Conte didn't really uh, rate him. And then he, he played his way into the team uh, er, uh, early this year definitively, and he was one of the key uh, figures in the winning the, the title. So he's a figure, uh, he's a player much respected in Italy. So the collapse uh, the other day uh, caused a huge, huge uh, sense of uh, dismay, and you know, there's been a, a lot of newspaper rinks built on it. Listen, uh, Paddy, uh, it's been great chatting to you this morning. Great insight, as always, into Italian football. And uh, no doubt we'll check in again before the tournament ends. And uh, hopefully Italy can continue this wonderful run that has us all on the edge of our seats. Paddy, uh, thanks for taking the call this morning. Thanks very much. Good stuff. Paddy Agnew there, the Italian football writer and journalist. I just want to uh, bring you a reminder of the three big games today as well in the European Championships. So I want to bring you a quick look at some of the Paddy Power markets uh, for today's games. Have a look. Three smashing matches in Euro 2020 this Thursday. Emmett O'Keefe, Paddy Power's football trader, joins me. Emmett, uh, some great football to look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully, I think I think we're uh, we're expecting I'm expecting three three high score matches, three high scoring games in, in on Thursday. Starting with the Ukraine against North Macedonia. Ukraine have only actually kept one clean sheet in their last nine competitive matches. 
and, and even though I think I expect them to beat North Macedonia, I think, I think we can expect both teams to score here. Then in, in, in the second match, Denmark against Belgium, this is a game where Denmark need to get a result after after losing to Finland. And even without Christian Eriksen, I still think they can they can cause a kind of an ageing Belgian defence problems. I think, and it, I think we know how high scoring Belgium can be under Roberto Martinez. I think a high scoring game is likely with both teams scoring. And then lastly, hopefully to finish off our treble, I think what could be the most exciting of the three games, Netherlands v Austria. Austria, oh, both teams play a very, very attacking style. Uh, we saw the Netherlands com- committing at times all three of their midfielders forward against the Ukraine. Uh, I could see, I think we could see a similar game to the to Netherlands 3-2 victory over Ukraine uh, in in the late game on Thursday. So uh, hopefully we, three high scoring games, each t- each team to score uh, on in, in in Thursday's matches. And, and if you back that and if both teams to score treble, you should get a price in and around the five to one mark. That's grand. So both teams to score in all three matches this Thursday in Euro 2020. So says Emmett O'Keefe. Thanks a million. Should mention another game we haven't spoken about yet. Group B yesterday in uh, St. Petersburg, of course. Finland nil, Russia won. Alexei Moranchuk with the goal in first half stoppage time. A good goal as well for the Russians. So they've got uh, their European Championships campaign uh, in terms of points uh, underway. Finland, of course, had that win over Denmark uh, in that game in which Christian Eriksen collapsed uh, the first day. Uh, Phil, we might just take a look at some of uh, today's games. In fact, all three of today's games. I'll first get a look at the, uh, the predictions table. So myself, Jer and Nathan have uh, been predicting games as the tournament has gone on. I'm still in the lead, Phil. Seven points. Oh, yeah, like the lads are only level with you when they <laughs> tally up their scores. So. Exactly. They're not good. They're not good. <laughs> but uh, we've gone for uh, Ukraine at Macedo- North Macedonia. We've all three of us, myself, Jer and Nathan, have gone for Ukraine. Denmark, Belgium, we've all gone for Belgium. And then the Netherlands Austria game has split us a little bit. Myself and Nathan going for the draw on that one. Uh, Jer opting for the Dutch. So we might start with, with Denmark, Belgium for yourself, Phil. Five o'clock in Copenhagen in Group B. How are you calling this one? Yeah, it's going to be a really um, strange occasion, obviously. I know the, the Danish players were back at the Parken Stadium last night. They didn't train there, but they went back. And it's almost just a deal with how it's going to be when they get there this evening for the game that they didn't want to be overwhelmed by it so then we know that Christian Eriksen's obviously in a hospital bed probably 500 metres away from the stadium and there's going to be a round of applause from the ball's going to be kicked out of play after 10 minutes where the the, the teams and the fans are all going to applaud to, to pay tribute to Christian Eriksen so you know, Denmark were a team that a lot of people had talked up before the tournament where they thought these this is a team that could spring a surprise, but you really don't know how they're going to react now. Obviously, um, the players, what they went through on Saturday, that, you know, emotionally, that is just going to do all sorts of damage to you. And, you know, it, it could unite uh, the, the team where, they're, they, you know, Christian Eriksen has, has t- spoken to the players and... They want to go out and put on a performance for him and um, there's going to be a bigger crowd there in Copenhagen. But saying that, it, the, the reality of it is they're playing Belgium, who are the top-ranked team in the world. And there's a fair chance De Bruyne that comes back in. Hazard obviously featured uh, off the bench in, in the win over Russia. So Denmark, even if they lose today, they still have a chance of qualifying because that Russia game. And I actually would fancy them to beat Russia in the last, in the last group game. So they might actually be OK provided the, that Belgium obviously beat Finland in the, the last group game. So I, I wouldn't rule Denmark out of getting out of the group. I, I would be leaning towards Belgium to get a, a result. But it's certainly, I think a lot of people are going to be talking about other things than the result after that game. Yeah, for sure. That's five o'clock. Uh, Denmark, Belgium in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, turn attention to Group C then, uh, Phil. The opening game of the uh, afternoon, Ukraine, North Macedonia, two o'clock in Bucharest. Uh, like Ukraine were were decent against the Dutch uh, leaky enough defence North Macedonia uh, fairly leaky defence themselves but um, how are you calling this one? Yeah I think this is a perfect game for Ukraine to get back on track and they would have been disappointed after getting back into the game against the Dutch but they again a team that did quite well in qualifying you know have some players that can make the difference obviously Sinchenko we're so used to seeing him playing as a left full with City but plays in midfield Yarmolenko obviously was a player that wasn't guaranteed to start but that goal against the Dutch means he's pretty much nailed on to start and yeah, I think they'd just be too good and then they get themselves right back into the group the 2 o'clock games haven't really caught life yesterday obviously the, the way things are with myself I tend to get the first half on the radio on the way home 
and I get ho home in time for the, the second half to watch it and I found the, the rush of Finland game yesterday was poor enough fair and maybe it was just the, it's the early starts but I was struggling to stay awake at times but in fairness the goal that won it was, was incredible from Moranchuk but yeah I, I think Ukraine get back I, the way I look at it, it North Macedonia are going to lose all three games and mm. the, the group gets decided then by how the others get on against each other so the, the Dutch would be just thinking that if they avoid defeat tonight, then they're going to win the group. How are you calling that one then? The Dutch against uh, Austria. That's 8 p.m. starting Amsterdam. So, look, look. if Gini Wijnaldum plays like he did, if um, Dumfries plays like he did, the Dutch have a serious chance of, of progressing, certainly at least to the last 16 in this tournament. But Austria are no, are no easy team to beat. No, it looks like De Ligt is back as well. So that's a, a big boost for them, obviously. We know what a, a big loss it is not to have Van Dijk there, but when they didn't have Van Dijk or De Ligt, then they're obviously not as strong at the back. But um, yeah, look, I, I know there's been a lot of criticism of Frank de Boer. I, I, I wouldn't be his, his biggest fan, but I think just given they have enough quality in that team to win the group, I don't think they're going to do much, maybe quarterfinals at the most. But yeah, I, I think that they'll... Um, they, they might just edge it against Austria tonight. Austria are going to make it quite hard for them to break them down, though. Yeah, three decent games uh, up for decision today as well. Phil, great stuff this morning. Thanks a million. Thanks thanks for having me. Phil Egan there, our own Phil Egan. If you missed any of today's Euro 2020 show, of course, the full podcast will be up very shortly on the OTB Sports app and indeed on otbsports.com. You can also watch it back on youtube.com forward slash off the ball. And we'll have plenty of clips as well on our Twitter and Instagram at off the ball. You'll get me on Twitter at shenhannon01. I'll be back tomorrow morning, Friday morning from 11 a.m. More games tomorrow. Sweden against Slovakia. Croatia against Czech Republic and the tiny matter of England-Scotland tomorrow night as well. So I'll be in the company of uh, Team 33's Enda Call and indeed Eamon Dunphy on tomorrow morning's sh show. So same time, same place tomorrow morning. We'll speak to you then. Have a good one. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Powers Save Our Game. A cane brace will bag 20k for Irish football. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie 